Hello YouTube. We're continuing our look at the objections that were raised against Darwinism prior to the modern synthesis. So there were three related objections uh, concerning the limits of selection. Um, many, many biologists felt that selection couldn't possibly play the major role that Darwin gave it and this inspired the search for other mechanisms. So I, I think there were essentially there were basically three arguments here. So one argument uh, arose out of an, an essentialism about species. Darwinism requires that small, uh, small gradations between species uh, occur. You can't draw a strict line between one species and another. Uh, this is simply the point that evolution by natural selection is a very gradual process. But a widespread view for a very long time was that species are fixed and unchanging. Every species has certain essential properties that define what it really is. And while there can be some variation within species, this variation has strict limits. The main source of support for this kind of view was artificial selection, which is somewhat ironic because Darwin himself drew explicit analogies between natural and artificial selection in explaining natural selection. Um, but OK, it's obvious that there is variation within species and that some variation is heritable. This has long allowed us to artificially select for uh, plants or animals with certain characteristics. Let's say you want to breed bigger dogs. Well, you start with a population of dogs and you only allow the biggest ones to reproduce. Then in the next generation, you only allow the biggest of those to reproduce. Then you only allow the biggest of their offspring to reproduce and so on. It won't take you very long to breed a pack of dogs with a very large body size. So far, that's totally compatible with Darwinism. But the trouble is that eventually you hit a point where your dogs just stop getting bigger. You probably won't be able to breed dogs bigger than the average horse. You certainly won't be able to get dogs bigger than elephants. Um, and also note that as artificial selection reaches the extremes, the results become maladaptive. The most extreme results generally couldn't survive in the wild. Think about very small dogs like chihuahuas. They'd be pretty useless if they were sent out to survive on their own. Um, but the most important point here is simply that we appear to have these limits to variation. So this provides uh, quite a bit of support for the idea that while there's variation in species, a species can only change so much. Now today, we, uh, we know that every species has a certain amount of natural genetic variation that arises through mutation. Uh, eventually, artificial selection runs out of mutation to work with. If you want to breed dogs bigger than horses, you'd have to wait for mutations at the low-key determining size, but that could take a very long time for the right mutations to emerge there. Uh, I mean, as, as we've seen in, in the last video, in Darwin's time, they simply didn't understand variation or, or mutation or inheritance. So this point about artificial selection probably looks like a very powerful objection to Darwinism. Uh, OK, many people held that selection could only play a, a generally negative role. One thing that everybody granted was that selection can eliminate deleterious mutations. Uh, if a wolf is born with uh, only one eye or with three legs, selection will probably eliminate that particular lineage very quickly. But there was much more scepticism over its positive role, over its ability to create new things. The trouble was that many things seemed to be beyond the reach of selection, and uh, this arises because as, as any evolutionist will emphasise, selection has no foresight. Selection can't plan for the future, it can only work with what's already there. This leads to the question of how it's possible for important structures to emerge in the first place. So take wings. Well, we might grant that selection can make small improvements to wings. Some wings will be better adapted to flying than others, so it's easy to see how selection can operate there. But how do wings get started? If evolution is gradual, then that sounds like there must have been a time when birds had half a wing. Well, what's the use of half a wing? Half a wing simply isn't going to work. And there are similar problems for other complex parts. What's the use for half an eye, half a liver, half a heart? Now, today we know how stupid this objection is. Part of the problem is that it's not that animals ever had half a wing in the sense of cutting modern wings in half. Uh, that's not the sense in which gradual change occurred. But nevertheless, I think this objection does have a great deal of intuitive force. And even today, this argument is probably the most popular strategy for creationists. They'll try to find structures that are too complex to have emerged by natural selection. One of the most recent attempts at running this argument concerns bacterial flagella. 
I think uh, Michael Behe, for instance, has insisted that flagella are just far too complex to have evolved by the accumulation of small changes. I think it tells you something that creationists have been reduced to appealing to bacterial flagella as evidence for the infinite power of God, but whatever, moving on. Okay, so not uh, not all of the examples um, uh, back then were based on complexity. George Myvert cited the uh, lovely example of the eyes of the flatfish. One particular kind of flatfish lays at the bottom of the ocean on its side. Now, in its early development, it looks like a normal fish. Okay, so one of its eyes is pointing down to the bottom and one eye will be pointing up um, and it can you know, see uh, everything above it. But as it matures, the eye uh, on the side facing the bottom moves over to the other side. There's an obvious adaptive advantage to having eyes on both sides, but the question is, how is it possible for this movement to occur? I mean, there doesn't appear to be any advantage to moving the eye one millimetre over. Uh, it, only, it only becomes an advantage once it's maybe not all the way, but once it's sort of far far enough uh, over that it can see more. Um, a more general argument for the purely negative role of selection was noted by John Dawson. He asks, what sort of conditions allow for the creation and preservation of new types of organisms? Well, intuitively, it would be, to quote Dawson, favourable conditions and a relatively easy life. He notes, for instance, the relative absence of life in, <coughs> in inhospitable places like the cold tundra of northern Asia. In these kinds of places, it's not just that the weak are eliminated, the strong are also in jeopardy. <coughs> now, this point probably seems fairly trivial, but the problem for Darwinism is that natural selection, the struggle for existence, will be at its most fierce where the conditions of life are extremely hard. Uh, and, and that's the case pretty much by definition. Selection will be stronger in difficult conditions. So what this point shows is that at the very places where selection is acting most strongly, the variation and progression of species is reduced, not increased. In inhospitable places like the tundra of northern Asia, selection is at its most fierce, and yet these places show the least diversity of life. So this seems to lend support to the claim that selection has a largely negative role rather than being a, a positive creative force. Okay, um, finally, non-adaptive structures. Natural selection only produces adaptations, traits that improve the chances of survival and reproduction. So one objection to Darwinism was that many traits appear to have little or no adaptive value. There are all sorts of traits that organisms have which don't appear to make any contribution to uh, their chances of survival. A couple of examples cited in Vernon Kellogg's Darwinism today are uh, All horses have horny calluses on their feet. N nobody knows what the use of these is. And furthermore, donkeys also have calluses, but only on two feet, not on all four. Uh, now, it seems ridiculous to say that having calluses on four feet is of uh, adaptive advantage to the horse but calluses on only two feet is of adaptive advantage to the donkey. Another example is that different species of mollusk have different markings in their shells, where these markings are constant to each species. But they can't possibly be of any selective value because they're covered by the epidermis and so would be invisible. In fact, the situation is worse than this because some traits appear to be actively maladaptive. A famous example were the enormous antlers of the Irish elk. The antlers were so big that they would probably get in the way of normal functioning, and uh, many paleontologists felt that this played a role in the extinction of the species. Uh, many other examples of this kind can be found, such as these birds with idiotically long tails. These are long-tailed widow birds. Um, notice, incidentally, that this supports the fourth objection we looked at concerning regular trends in evolution. The antlers of the Irish elk and these ridiculous tales are examples of species trending in a single linear direction, even against the grain of selection. Um, a classic case of maladaptive change is reproductive isolation between species. Species change gradually. Um, species diverge gradually. So you start with one species that can interbreed. Then uh, different populations of the species begin to diverge and eventually you end up with two distinct species, neither of which can breed with the other. The problem here was summed up nicely by T.H. Morgan, uh, and I quote, 
If two varieties were to some extent at the start less fertile inter se than, they, than with their own kind, the only way in which they could become more infertile through selection would be by selecting those individuals in each generation that are still more infertile. But forms of this sort would, ex hypothesi, become less numerous than the descendants of each species itself, which would therefore supplant the less fertile ones. In other words, selection can only act to increase fertility, not decrease it. Um, those organisms that can interbreed with both populations would have more offspring than the organisms that are limited, limited to one population. This problem is particularly serious given how important reproductive isolation is in the emergence of new species. Uh, in many, many species definitions, uh, on, on, on many uh, ideas of species, species are literally defined in terms of reproductive isolation. So this is quite a big problem. Okay, now Darwin himself had two arguments in defence uh, uh, of this point about non-adaptive structures. He said, first of all, in many cases, we just don't know enough about the lives of organisms to judge the adaptive value of particular traits. Traits that seem to be useless uh, might, if we could follow the organism everywhere, be seen to have a selective advantage. And in this context, he introduced the theory of sexual selection. So the tails of these birds might be produced because males with longer tails are, pre are preferred by females. Second, some traits might be connected together. An adaptive character might be correlated with a, a useless or even a maladaptive character, in which case selection for the, for the adaptive character will also proliferate the useless or the maladaptive one. And both of these points are actually correct. We know that sexual selection is extremely powerful and that many seemingly useless characters have slight adaptive advantage, and even the slightest adaptive advantage can be enough for selection to do its work. We also know about things like pleiotropy in which a single gene affects two or more traits, uh, genetic linkage where two genes are often inherited together, and so on. But at Darwin's time, um, this kind of response, I think, would have at best introduced agnosticism. <clears throat> because, of course, Darwin couldn't, uh, again, he didn't have an account of inheritance that was uh, persuasive. <clears throat> so the fact is that many people felt that Darwinism was just too extreme, that it overemphasised adaptation. Darwin's attempts to see everything in adaptive terms, for instance, by uh, explaining cumbersome tales as a matter of sexual selection, were seen as essentially just speculation. By the, by the standards of the time, that might well have been a reasonable point. Um, it looks like the best that Darwin could, could do in response to this problem of non-adaptive characters was to say, well, we can't be sure that these traits aren't adaptive. But is that really a very... I mean, that's not, that's not a very good response. It's not persuasive. You know, I think it was quite natural that biologists look, looked for mechanisms that could produce useless or maladaptive traits. Okay, there were a number of fierce objections to Darwin's methodology. First, induction. The, um, the philosophical foundations of science at the time were not well worked out, but what many scientists and philosophers of science at, at uh, emphasised was the importance of the inductive method. Now, exactly what is meant by the inductive method differs from one person to another. Um, as I said, the foundations were not well worked out, so it's difficult to give a precise characterization. But broadly speaking, the inductive method is based on observation and the idea that uh, good science proceeds from the observation of particular facts to general conclusions. You make various observations and you build up from these observations to a general theory. This contrasts with the method of coming up with theories first, or coming up with theories after making only a few observations, and then applying these theories to the phenomena. Uh, this way of proceeding is, was seen as being hypothetical and speculative. If you want to get things right, the focus has to be on accumulating observations. A famous analogy that was used around this time was that of a pyramid. On the inductive method, you start with observations as the base of the pyramid, and then you build up to a theory that captures all your observations. That's the tip of the pyramid. Starting with theory is like inverting the pyramid, trying to build a pyramid upside down, starting from the point, which of course is unstable. No matter how clever and beautiful your theories, you can't do science in this kind of way. Of course, these days we don't really care how people come up with theories. 
Um, I mean, obviously science has to be supported by observational evidence, but that's a matter of the justification of theories. We draw a distinction between the context of, of discovery and the context of justification. You can discover a theory however you like. Maybe you see it in a crystal ball or it appears to you in a dream. What matters is the evidence you can come up with to defend it. Um, unfortunately for Darwin, this distinction wasn't drawn very carefully in his day. Many people argued that Darwin didn't apply the uh, appropriate inductive methodology. And this does look like kind of an old criticism, because if you read anything about Darwin, you'll see that he spent an enormous amount of time gathering empirical evidence. Still, it, it wasn't inductive according to many people, um, more like building a pyramid upside down rather than starting from the base. I think there are basically two concerns here. First of all, the way that natural selection itself is presented in, in very logical, deductive terms. So you start with some simple facts, such as the uh, the fact of heritable variation and the differential survival and reproduction of, of individuals. And then you make some obvious inferences from, from these to this idea of natural selection. Then you show that evolution by natural selection is the best explanation for various observations. Natural selection provides the best way of organising and explaining the phenomena. I don't think we'd have too many objections to this method these days, but of course if the emphasis is on induction and starting with observations, there's going to be a lot of resistance to this. Uh, because this clearly involves interpreting observations in the light of the theory, rather than making observations in an unbiased way and then building theory on them. A second point that was made, uh, for instance, by Adam Sedgwick, was that although Darwin seemed to appeal to many facts, um, he, he didn't really. Um, we, we can't really make inductive inferences about the development of life as a whole, because life has only developed once. Darwin is really making... Uh, an inductive inference from just one observation, which is clearly inappropriate. That would be like saying, uh, the bird I see in my garden is white, therefore all birds are white. Uh, so Sedgwick's idea seemed to be that since um, the development of life has only occurred once, um, Darwin was, although he seemed to be appealing to lots of different observations, he was really just making one observation. This seemed like a really dumb criticism to me. In fact, I think both of these points uh, are incredibly unfair. Even by the standards of the time, the idea that Darwin was just unscientific, I, I think that was extremely unfair. Um, now, a related, but I think a, a somewhat more powerful criticism of the methodology of Darwinism was that it relied too much on speculation and conjecture. So the problem here is that it's always possible to come up with selective explanations of phenomena. For almost any part of any organism, you can invent a story about how this could have arig arisen by small changes that provide an adaptive advantage. For instance, we can explain the giraffe's long neck by saying that, oh, well, maybe uh, th there was fierce competition between species for lower hanging food, um, those giraffes that had slightly longer necks had less competition for food, so were able to eat more, and the necks get bigger. That's a plausible story. But ultimately, this story is just conjecture. You can't go back in time and observe what actually happened to the species over many generations. And it's worse than this, because if one explanation is shown to be false, it's always possible to simply come up with another. Suppose the evidence showed that in the past there was actually greater competition for food higher in the trees, maybe because it's being eaten by birds. So giraffes would have had less access to food as their necks got longer. Well, that's no problem for the Darwinian. Maybe giraffes evolved long necks by, natural, uh, by sexual selection. Maybe, maybe it was to make them look bigger and more scary to potential predators, or whatever. Uh, can you see the problem here? This, this whole Darwinian programme looks like it's built on, on just speculative stories. And in fact, there have been worries about this even after the modern synthesis. One of the most famous papers of modern biology is Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewontin's The Spandrels of San Marco and the Panglossian Paradigm, which is a, a critique of adaptationism. Adaptationism is uh, essentially this method of invoking adaptive explanations for everything. If you haven't read it, um, you need to do so. Uh, it's, it's online, so it's, it's easily available. Although bear in mind that it was very controversial, so you'll probably want to read some responses to it. And anything that Stephen Jay Gould says, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, okay. Now, anyway, anyway, uh, beyond these more philosophical points about Darwin's methodology, there were also practical worries. 
the, the models of su successful science at that time were physics and chemistry, with a, their focus on controlled laboratory experiments. Darwin came from a very different tradition. Evolution by natural selection isn't something you can demonstrate in the laboratory, or at least you couldn't in Darwin's day. It's actually quite easy to do so now with um, bacteria and, and, and stuff. Um, now, to be fair, none of the alternatives to Darwinism could have been demonstrated in controlled laboratory conditions either. So, uh, I, I guess all parties to the debate about evolution would have granted that uh, researching this requires going out into the wild, making field observations, maybe doing a few experiments, but by and large it's a very different ballgame to harder sciences like physics and chemistry. So, on, on this on this particular point, Darwinism isn't any worse off than any other theory of evolution, but nevertheless it's easy to see how this could have generated scepticism. Okay, so the final point, um, and I suppose this one really follows from uh, other points that we've we've covered, but I think it's worth mentioning separately. Uh, certainly, it's, b before the, um, the success of the modern synthesis, there was a general feeling that Darwinism simply lacked evidence that it just didn't have um, much evidence in, in its favour. Now, Darwin does cite a great deal of evidence in the origin, but as, as I think I've mentioned, much of that evidence was evidence of evolution in general, not necessarily evolution by natural selection. Um, Ernst Mayer points out uh, in, in The Growth of Biological Thought that even many of Darwin's supporters accepted that Darwinism was, was weak on evidence and was based more on deduction and, na and analogies. Uh, in this context, Mayer notes that the discovery of mimicry was, to uh, to quote Mayer, a godsend. Mimicry was described a few years after the origin by Henry Bates in his work on butterflies. So, some species of butterfly are inedible to predators. They taste really nasty or they're toxic and poisonous. Predators that eat these horrible butterflies will, will learn to avoid them. And they'll also learn to avoid similar butterflies. They'll learn to avoid butterflies that resemble the nasty ones. So what will happen is that a perfectly edible species will evolve to mimic the inedible species. Then predators that learn to avoid the inedible species will also avoid the edible ones. This is known as Batesian mimicry. Another form was discovered by Fritz Müller, uh, where two inedible species mimic each other, and that's Müllerian mimicry. So because they're both inedible, they both kind of reinforce the uh, the avoidance. Um, these are, th this is an example of mimicry, the, the monarch and viceroy butterflies. Um, I think this is a case of Müllerian mimicry. I think these are both, uh, both inedible. Uh, so why was this a godsend? Well, because this seems like a very clear and striking example of organisms altering their morphology in line with selective advantage. Why else would the colour patterns of two distantly related species resemble each other to such a great extent? It seems clear that what's going on here is that one species gains an adaptive advantage by resembling the other, um, or they, they both gain an adaptive advantage by resembling each other. And as you can see, this also shows the incredible power of natural selection, its incredible creative power. Natural selection can tailor organisms in incredibly detailed, intricate ways. So this is um, quite a nice piece of uh, empirical evidence. Uh, now, obviously, it, it's not, uh, you know, it's not knockdown, uh, it's not a knockdown argument. This is a highly restricted example. Showing that natural selection produces the colour of butterflies hardly shows that it's the central force in evolution. And in any case, the, the Darwinist account of mimicry ended up being harshly criticised. Um, a, a thorough criticism of Darwinist accounts of mimicry is given by Leo Berg in his book Nomogenesis. And I'd like to focus on Berg's criticisms in a bit more detail because I think to us today, mimicry seems like an obvious confirmation of natural selection. But examining the points raised by Berg shows just how contested the evidence was. So let's have a look at... Um, at some of Berg's criticisms. First of all, Berg notes that mimicry occurs when the organisms inhabit the same geographic range. It would be completely useless for an edible butterfly in the Amazon to mimic an inedible one in Africa. But Berg points out that there are plenty of cases of mimicry where the organisms live in totally different places. For instance, the yellow-throated longclaw from Africa and the uh, eastern meadowlark from the Americas. Now, obviously, this isn't really an example of mimicry. How could it be? 
But that's precisely Burke's point. When two species that resemble each other inhabit the same geographic area, we assume that it's a case of, of mimicry. Uh, we assume that they resemble each other because this was of adaptive advantage to one or both species. But this is just an assumption. There's, I mean, there's no doubt that if a tasty butterfly resembles an inedible butterfly, this will be useful to the tasty butterfly. But we shouldn't simply assume that they resemble each other because it's useful to the tasty butterfly. Maybe they resemble each other for other reasons. Maybe there's some internal chemical structure driving them down the same evolutionary pathway, for instance. We don't have to appeal to selection. And the fact that um, we have cases of striking resemblance uh, where the organisms don't inhabit the same area, so they couldn't possibly um, be a case of adaptive advantage of mimicry, uh, that suggests that maybe we should look at those other, other mechanisms. Second, and I guess this point is uh, really a generalisation of the first, there are cases of entirely useless mimicry, where two species inhabit the same area and resemble each other, but predators aren't deterred by either of them. Similarly, some cases of mimicry simply leave the mimic species open to new predators. Um, Berg cites the case of clear-wing moths that resemble wasps and bees. This presumably deters some predators, but it will only attract the bee-eating birds. Third, Many species are subject to severe attacks from predators, yet have no tendency to mimicry. Why not? If variation is random, surely the opportunity for mimicry should be open to pretty much all species. Finally, surely it would be more useful for an edible species not to mimic an inedible one, but simply to acquire its inedibility. Natural selection should favour toxicity and poison more than mimicry. Now, another objection to, to um, Darwinist accounts of mimicry that wasn't given by Berg, but I'll mention it anyway. Um, recall the eighth objection concerning the negative role of selection. Well, um, similarly, mimicry is an all-or-nothing adaptation. It's easy to see the value uh, of an edible butterfly closely resembling an inedible one, but how do you get to close resemblance through gradual changes? What would be the value of having, say, a little patch of orange here, a little white dot there? Now again, um, the point of all this is not that it would always be useless for one species to uh, resemble another. The point is rather that explaining the origin of uh, resemblance in terms of the adaptive advantage of mimicry is open to question. On Berg's view, resemblance occurs because of internal factors that drive certain species along the same lines. Okay, so those were some uh, objections to Darwinism. Uh, now, along with these objections to Darwinism, another reason for resistance to the theory was that many scientists simply misunderstood it. Ernst Mayer, uh, in The Growth of Biological Thought, points to two sources of confusion. First, there was ambiguity in the term selection. The major problem is that the word selection implies a selector. It implies somebody doing the selecting, which can lead people to miss the point that natural selection is totally blind and mechanistic. In particular, many people had the impression that Darwin was personifying or anthropomorphizing nature. Uh, to quote Mayer, Darwin's critics were quite outraged by the uninhibited personification of nature. Wherever the natural theologian might have invoked God, Darwin invokes nature. There were some people who had the feeling, and this was unfair, but it was there all the same, uh, that, that Darwin was treating nature as an agent. So on this objection, unlike the very first objection we saw, Darwin hasn't eliminated teleology and purpose at all. He simply transferred it from God to an anthropomorphised nature. This was not a fair criticism, but Darwin probably didn't do himself any favours since he repeatedly emphasised the analogy between natural selection and artificial selection. Uh, indeed, that's literally where the phrase natural selection came from. He adopted it by analogy with artificial selection. But artificial selection clearly involves a selector, you have breeders who choose which organisms will reproduce. Second, there was confusion over the role of chance versus determinism. Uh, this confusion continues even to this day among creationists who are sceptical of evolution. Um, Darwin rejected the idea that evolution had, has any kind of goal or end. Evolution is not determined to go in any particular direction. Now, many people in Darwin's day could see only one alternative to this, chance. If evolution doesn't proceed along determined lines, it must be a matter of chance, of accident. But to say that something as complex and intricate as the eye or heart could have arisen by uh, 
uh, chance and could be maintained by chance is clearly absurd. Well, as Mayer notes, this was a false dilemma. Uh, natural selection in, is neither pure chance nor pure determinism, but involves a third kind of process. And this is because it has two steps. The first step is heritable variation, uh, and, and this variation is a matter of chance. Um, at least, uh, according to Darwin, variation was random with respect to the needs of the organisms. And the next part involves differential survival and reproduction of organisms, where this difference in survival and reproduction is caused by differences in heritable traits. This is not a matter of chance, nor is it completely determined. It's probabilistic. Um, in general, being able to run faster improves the survival of rabbits, but it's always possible that even the fastest runner might get hit by a freak lightning strike. Uh, and of course, different traits will confer different probabilities of survival and reproduction. Some traits will have high adaptive value, others might only make a tiny bit of difference. In the modern world, I don't think we have too much of a problem with any of this, um, again, putting aside creationists, uh, but this just goes to show how well we've absorbed the lessons of nat natural selection and probabilistic thinking in general. In Darwin's time, the false dilemma between chance and necessity was deeply ingrained. Mayer quotes Darwin himself making this error. Darwin says he was greatly troubled by, I quote, the extreme difficulty, or rather impossibility, of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe as the result of blind chance or necessity. It took a conceptual revolution to produce a, a new, uh, different way of seeing things. Okay, so those were the, the main uh, objections and the main sources of resistance to Darwinism before the uh, modern synthesis. Now, some of the objections that we've seen are quite weak. Uh, many of them are based on, on falsehoods or misunderstandings, uh, and I think pretty much all of them can be answered these days. Um, and actually, uh, Dar Darwinians, uh, even back then, had responses to the objections, and there was good evidence that, that they did have evidence in favour of Darwinism. Nevertheless, I think it's quite clear that at the time, scepticism of Darwinism was totally justified. Uh, it was perfectly reasonable to try alternative theories. In the next video, we'll examine some of those alternatives. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.